this presentation will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube and social media. So uh, if you miss anything, don't hesitate to rewatch the video or reach out to me by phone or email. We'll always be here. Okay, let's start. So the application walkthrough tonight, I'll try to keep it dense. I know we slotted for an hour, but we're going to keep it packed with the Barn Initiative, just to let you guys know the context of the program and how, you know, uh, applications are selected and why they're selected in the specific context, the eligibility of projects, expenses, and buildings and, and your property, the evaluation criterion, and that's how it's specifically scored or what the committee is looking for when we're selecting the final grant awardees, the public benefit requirement, like, you know, uh, this is a state program, so there has to be some way of engagement with the public that I'll go through. Of course, the application preparation, it might look like a, a daunting packet at first, but we'll break it down to the most important parts. And of course, project selection and award announcement, that's going to be the timeline. And then the project uh, requirements and obligations, what you might look forward to if you were to be selected. So the Heritage Barn Initiative was started with the substitute house bill 2115 back in May of 2007, I believe. So we're on our seventh cycle or seventh biennium of the uh, Heritage Barn Grant Program. And every year about a dozen or so, I think maybe one year there was like 22 barns that get selected based on a allocated uh, pool of state funds. And the reason why it was established was to commemorate barns as a historically significant resource representing the agricultural, economic, and cultural development of the state of Washington. So it's a way to both give back to the community, but also celebrate the heritage of, of agricultural history within the state of Washington. So if you guys are here, you're probably a farmer or have come from a family of farmers in some way. And this is one way that we can acknowledge that history and really celebrate it by you know, helping you preserve the properties that represent that kind of history. Of course, it is a, a competitive matching grant program to heritage barn owners in their efforts to preserve, stabilize, and rehabilitate their barn. So it is a what we call a capital improvement kind of program, as in we're looking to fix or improve or restore or preserve some kind of brick and mortar physical asset that is uh, portraying of that agricultural history. And the, uh, the bill also established the Heritage Barn Advisory Committee, which reviews both the uh, nominations for the Heritage Barn Register, as well as who gets selected for the Heritage Barn Grant. So there's a two parts to this initiative, right? It's beginning the register, which is a, you know, a, a state historic register, a list of historic buildings, specifically barns or agricultural uh, resources that embody that agricultural history. And we'll talk about how to make sure you're either already on it or how to get on it um, shortly. So the Heritage Barn Register means that any large, or it's for, it's a list for any large agricultural outbuilding used to house animals, crops, or farm equipment that is over 50 years old. That is a basic benchmark so that we can easily define what historic is. But if your barn is a little younger than 50 or way older than 50, you know, it's not, that's not really the determining factor of whether or not it gets recognized by the Heritage Barn Register. What they're looking for is historic significance and integrity. And what that means is significance is what the barn or the agricultural building represents in terms of an architectural history or a historic event or pattern. So let's say that your barn was the, the, the first or the premier barn for uh, dairy production back in the 1850s or something like that, right? Then that means that there is a significance to your barn. Or let's say that your barn was the first gave uh, uh, some kind of new technology, like it was the first uh, double copula within the state of Washington or something like that. We want to highlight those different kinds of significance, whether it's historic or aesthetic or architectural, or maybe a famous 
uh, the first African American farmer within your community developed this farm and and uh, built this barn. Those are the kinds of things that you know helps us get one aspect of the registration to the barn register, and the other is integrity, making sure that whatever that significance is, it's still manifested uh, visually or physically uh, within your property. So let's say that you know you had a barn that represented uh, dairy history, but it's been completely uh, renovated and stripped and it's turned into uh, an Airbnb or a mother-in-law suite and all the siding was replaced with vinyl material. It's kind of hard to get it on the register because it doesn't represent that agriculture history that it was supposed to, right? But to check to see if you're already on the register, uh, you would contact Michael Hauser, the state architectural historian at the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. Just like my contact, his is all over the website as well as the application materials, but I can reiterate that uh, towards the end if you guys need me to. Um, so check with Michael to make sure that you're on the register or how to get on the register for your barn. And like I mentioned, uh, it is one of the criterion to be part of the grant program is that one, it is on the Heritage Barn Register for the state or also the National Register of Historic Places. Now, it's pretty uncommon that it's on the state, but not the national or the national, but not the state. But we're just putting it in there just to make sure that, you know, we capture every kind of eligible property. Um, and that's also something that Michael can help really pinpoint. And then not only does your property need to be listed on that state register, it also needs to be in some need of substantial repair. Obviously, we can't prioritize buildings that are already in great condition or buildings that are demolished. Uh, we're looking for properties that need just a little bit more assistance, either coming back to life and, and, and coming back to their full agricultural glory or buildings that you know, you've tried to maintain, but you, everyone's expenses are, are limited and we don't have the, the means to, to finish out a full project, right? So it has to be historically significant with its pieces mostly intact, and then also has to uh, need some substantial repair. And that's the kind of programming that the uh, Heritage Barn Grant Program is trying to tackle. And that's it. And you might think that's easy. Well, my barn is historic. It's already there. And of course, I'm watching this presentation because my barn needs grant assistance. But the thing is that it's competitive, right? So your grant materials and showing that you're in the most need compared to your um, significance or integrity is important. And that's what we're gonna address today within your, your complete application. So my job tonight is to make sure that you're uh, submitting an application that most best uh, articulates both your historic significance of your barn property, as well as the need like if if my barn does not get this grant, it's going to fall down and we're going to lose a important ar agricultural resource for the state. Right. So that's kind of the narrative that you want to build around your your application. But of course, honesty and accuracy is important, too, uh, because we want to make sure that we allocate the funds in uh, the most effective and meaningful way. So what kind of projects uh, does the application uh, does the does the grant apply to and the easiest answer is brick and mortar or capital improvements physical uh renovations restorations preservation and maintenance onto your building but let's break that down a little bit more we're going to look at work that preserves the historic characters features and materials of eligible buildings so while you know any kind of brick and mortar capital improvement project isn't prohibited by any means, except for additions, like when you're building something new or attaching something to it or uh, adding something that wasn't historically there, what the scoring criterion or the uh, the committee is going to look into is which pro which uh, projects are really focusing on historic character features and materials like wood siding or restoration of a cupola or restoration of the, the historic roof form. Um, and we're trying, to, we're trying to focus on those, but if you're trying to do foundation work or interior 
agricultural related equipment. Um, you know, those are certainly eligible products or projects, but we want to prioritize the most visible historic aspects of it. So that's just something to keep in mind. All work must comply with the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation of historic properties. It's basically a set of rules that uh, guides the field of historic preservation. But in short, it just means that we want to maintain historic materials, historic uh, elements, historic architectural elements, and avoid adding new materials or new additions that aren't compatible with that uh, historic look or construction or structure, right? So whenever you're introducing something new, we want to make sure that it's historically compatible with the existing design or structure of your building. Um, and if you ever have any questions on, you know, whether or not your project meets that exact definition, you can always give us a call or email. But in short, uh, if you're doing in-kind replacement or repairs and you're not changing anything, it's probably likely going to comply with the Secretary of Interior standards. Um, and then, of course, when you think about those kinds of projects, we divide it into four categories for you so that it's easy for you to explain your project as well as budget it out in a very phased way so that it's not just a bunch of little things combined into one project, but it's, it's very structured. So we know exactly if you're gonna do roofing or stabilization, we're gonna break it down for you. So when you're developing your project, you want to make sure that it fits into one of these four categories. Re-roofing, that's super common for the barn grant program. I think like either 30 to 50% of all barn grants are just for re-roofing because it's, it's such a common need. Structural stabilization. So we're looking at foundation repair, um, walls, structural beams. Those are things that aren't the roof. And I think I put re-roofing twice there, but I meant foundation repair. So when you're thinking of structural, you're thinking of foundations, walls, inside and outside, what's keeping the structure up. Three is exterior restoration. So this is gonna be the more common architectural elements that people might think of when they think of historic preservation, like you're replacing windows or uh, sliding barn doors or the cupola or the siding. Um, those are elements that we want to see restored because they are character defining features of a building. And when you're submitting for exterior restoration, you're going to want to show the what the existing windows look like and then what the repro proposed replacement looks like. Or if you're able to find a window repair person, um, you know, that's always encouraged. And of course, interior finishes like stalls, flooring, electrical, mechanical, agricultural related equipment, such as a hay fork or milking stanchions. What we're looking for here are interior things that are attached to the building that you can't take out like you know any kind of equipment that uh, is wheeled out of the barn it's we're thinking about built-in systems of the building um and like i like i mentioned earlier there aren't any capital improvement projects that are necessarily prohibited uh but we do want to prioritize buildings and projects that are for uh historic ag agricultural restoration rather than say um, you know, turning into a uh, uh, accessory dwelling or uh, a short-term um, housing unit or something like that. We want to maintain that agricultural history, but, you know, if, if your project is, is really well thought out and really well explained and it still some way contributes to agricultural history, there's, like I said, there's not really any way, any projects that's prohibited except for uh, new construction and additions. And uh, I just grabbed this, uh, this image off of Google. Um, I just typed in barn addition, right? And this is a contemporary barn where they uh, use metal cladding and added almost a giant warehouse to it. Uh, this isn't something that we could support or the committee could support um, because it doesn't fall in line with the Secretary of Interior standards. So just keep that in mind. We're trying to restore existing features or or missing features that you know were historically there, but they fell down or, or got demolished a long time ago and you're trying to rebuild it or something like that. That's what we're trying to, to focus in on with the, with the program. 
So now that you know which buildings or which barns are eligible and what kind of projects are eligible, we want to think about the eligible expenses. So really it's any related uh, expenditures directly to construction. So that's gonna include the materials, the labor, the overhead, the sales tax. As long as you can bill it towards uh, a brick and mortar or capital improvement project, it's most likely eligible for, uh, for a grant award or another way to think about it is for reimbursement because uh, keep in mind that all barn projects that are awarded, they have to basically complete the project and then the grant is rewarded back as a reimbursement. So we're gonna talk about that in a bit when we start budgeting and, and planning for your project because uh, we need to see that you're able to start the project um, without you know, the, the upfront assistance. So another thing to think about is the timeline. Uh, we want to uh, be able to reimburse construction related expenditures for barns made after this biennium cycle, which is technically July 1st, 2021. Um, but really to be safe, it's, it's best to not do any work to buy any materials to sign any contracts until the grant contract has been signed, which uh, to, according to the, the timeline of the program is likely gonna be in January, 2021. So if you, uh, if you saw the application materials, the application closes mid-October. We take two months to, um, to gather the materials and prepare it to present it to the committee and the committee reviews it and, and submits their selection in around December. And by that time, we're uh, preparing the award announcements and we're notifying uh, select the selected project. It's gonna be around January, 2020 is when we get those contracts out that says exactly what projects are funded, how it's gonna be funded, how much is funded. So uh, really, you shouldn't start any projects or pay for any projects if you want it to be part of the, uh, the grant program until after a grant contract has signed. Now, uh, other expenses that are not eligible for reimbursement are soft costs such as uh, conditions assessment or a structural investigation or even permitting. Like I said, we want it to be directly related to the construction rather than the administrative costs around the construction. Uh, that can't be reimbursed. However, it can be used towards your uh, required match. So that means that uh, if you're spending, you know, $2,000 on, on a small project, $1,000 can be that administrative, but that other thousand has to be towards that brick and mortar physical uh, capital improvement. And then that, that $1,000 towards the physical capital improvement is what we can reimburse you back as a grant award. So just keep that in mind. And we're going to go through uh, soft costs and, uh, and, and hard cash matches when we get to the budgeting section. And of course, as I mentioned the projects that aren't available or aren't eligible for funding. So keep in mind that because this, use, this uses state dollars, it, there has to be some kind of public, uh, public engagement aspect to it because we want to celebrate the agricultural history of the state. So it can't be a, a tiny building tucked in the middle of nowhere that no one is allowed to visit, right? So this doesn't mean that you have to let people onto your property or anything like that. Uh, the easiest way to, to meet this requirement is visibility from the public right of way. So if your barn is visible from a street or a highway, um, you know, that's just, that's just an easy way to make sure that it's part of the public fabric of the land, right? Um, and if it's not, we can talk about the occasional public tours and events. Um, I think a, a few barns here or there uh, have like a annual daily or annual um, uh, season where they allow the public to come pick berries or, or, or harvest on, on their property. Um, or even an educational program like school tours, or simply saying that, you know, you'll let us go film something at the property or, or to show off your barn for the next uh, biennium cycle. Uh, just making sure that, you know, the, the, the grant dollars goes towards something that is helping and accessible to the public. It's, it's pretty clear there. 
Okay, so now you guys understand the full context of the, uh, of the grant program, what it's for, what is it trying to do, what are the general requirements around that. Now we're gonna go directly to the application so that we can help you submit the best application that, uh, that really shows off your barn as well as the project and the preparation and the need uh, behind it. So, um, the application itself is an online application that I'm going to switch to the screen to. But before I do that, I just want to break down the sections for you. So seeing here 10 sections, it might seem a little intimidating, but uh, most of it is just contact information, easy stuff like making sure that uh, you describe exactly where your barn is or who the owner versus you as the applicant, if you're helping out a family member or uh, a nonprofit organization. Um, those are all the easy stuff, but the stuff that we really want to hit on today is section four through seven, as well as how to do attachments when we get to that online form, right? So with the building description, it's like the who, right? Like who would this grant award support? The building condition assessment, I'll show you how to go through that, is the why should we support this specific project? And you know, not to exaggerate, but the short answer for most of these uh, applicants should be, if I, if I don't get support for it, my barn's going to fall down and I can't use it and we're going to lose a public good, right? The, the visibility of that agricultural history. Um, but we all obviously want you to be honest in your answers. So there's ways to do that building assessment, and I'll show you. Of course, the project proposal and budget, that's the what. What what is the project that, that the committee or the initiative or the state dollars is supporting? And there you wanna show that you're prepared to do this project, that you talk to contractors, that you've gotten quotes, that you've gotten bids, and the budget to show that you have the money ready to perform the work and that you understand part of the project is that it's a reimbursement and that we can't provide upfront support. And then the in-kind cash match uh, showing your contributions to the project. So remember that it is a one-to-one -one match. Another way to think about that is you pay 50% and the state pays 50% as a grant, as support. Um, but a, a different way to think about that is you pay 100% of the project. And in turn, the state gives back 50% because they support your capital improvement project because you restored a public good that uh, embodies agricultural history within the state of Washington. And then attachments are all the things, all the photos and documents and word files and bids and, assess and uh, conditions assessments that you want to attach to the online application. Um, and there's a checklist for that so that when you're ready to, when you've got all your materials in one place, you're ready to type it all up and you're ready to submit it, you have it all in one place. And we're going to go through that. Um, so before we go there, let's go to the actual form. So if you go to our website, preservewa.org, and you can find that on our social media, as well as on the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservations page as well, all of it links to the, uh, the grant application and the grant program landing page, and you'll find all the information there. So here you'll go to programs, you'll go to grants, you'll go to barn. And here is the program landing page. It has, if, if you miss anything here today, uh, obviously you can contact us by phone or email, but all the information is reiterated here as well. And I'll also post a recording here. Uh, guidelines and procedures is a PDF packet, basically a, a, a word packet that explains all of it textually as well. And you can print this out and you know write over it, scribble it, um, check mark it because it has all the information that helps you prepare for the application. And um, me presenting to you today is just a verbalization of this packet. So be sure to, to take a look at that. But when you're ready for it, you're going to click on this application. 
And there is a, um, a save feature. If you want to fill it out, you know, if you take a few days or a few weeks to fill it out, there is a save feature within the online application. So you can do that as well. But uh, I recommend that you start your own Word document and your own file folder and you put it all in one place. And when you're ready to come back to it, you sit down and you fill this out. Um, and you can copy and paste the, your, um, the things that you type out in preparation. But property owner, pretty clear. Owner information, pretty clear. Applicant information. This is if you're not the owner. Um, and if you click, I am not the owner, it pops out. So, um, you know, don't, don't worry if you don't see those fields right away. So you wanna fill out the application chronologically from top to bottom, because some of the fields um, show themselves when you click on them. So building description, uh, half of it is the physical description of the building, but the other half is that, that uh, historic significance and integrity part, right? So you just wanna explain, you know, how big the building is, the construction dates, if you know it, the current use and the historic use of the barn. You know, these narratives help us understand uh, where the barn came from and where it is today. And we can use our, you know, our understanding of agricultural history to fill in those gaps and to, to build a, an identity or historic significance for your barn for, so we can understand it and we can pitch it to the, the committee. Historic and cultural significance. So basically this means uh, describing the relative historical and cultural significance of the barn or farmstead for which the grant funds are being requested. Um, and if you need further uh, help on this, or maybe you think that this barn was already listed or you've already done this kind of work, or, or maybe your, your, um, your grandparents or whoever came before you already did this work, like I said, don't hesitate to check in with, uh, with Michael Hauser. Um, he might already have some information on file for you. But here, we just want to understand both the physical and the historical description of the barn. Tell us everything you know and tell us why it's important to you or your community or your family. Um, that helps us understand the who of the grant. So next is the building condition assessment. And that's the part of explaining the physical um, condition of the barn, right? So there is a list that I provide in the, uh, in the guideline packet that you can download. And let me go back to the presentation for you. So here um, you see foundation, foundation sill plates, roof sheathing, cladding, roof structure. Um, you know, go through the list and basically you're going to want to define each condition as either good, as in functioning, no problems, no, uh, no deterioration, um, fair, as in, you know, there's some wear and tear into it, but it's generally still functioning and, uh, and failing, which means that it's, it's way deteriorated. It really needs the most attention. Um, and you're gonna fill out this, basically like a quiz on each one. And you could either, um, you know, Use from memory, because obviously you're, you know your barn more than anyone else. You, you walk around the barn all the time. You probably know all this, or you could take, take out um, the, the pen and paper and, and, and a clipboard and, and fill it out with you while you're actually around there. But whenever you mark something as poor or failing, it's most important to get good photos of those areas so that we know that uh, it's an accurate description of your barn or your property and that we know your project addresses those features. So to reiterate, anytime you put poor or failing, you're gonna wanna send a few good, clear digital photos of it right off the bat. So make sure you have your, your camera phone or your, um, you know, your, your, your digital camera with you so that you can prepare to take photos for these uh, key architectural elements. And then when you finish filling that out, you can explain it more verbally uh, and, and really tell us the noteworthy details of it. So an example that I put in here is that the walls show a visible lean and are at risk of collapse. Four windows and two barn doors are missing or boarded up. 
within the past last decade. So you kind of want to give a timeline and a visual description for it so that we know exactly what you mean by poor or failing or what you mean by good and fair. And then of course, uh, a barn maintenance and repair history. This just gives us a context of, uh, it isn't to show that you know you, you haven't worked on the barn for 20 years and you, don't, and you neglect your barn, it's nothing like that. It's, it's for us to understand that um, how long maintenance lasts or how much maintenance you are doing, but it's still not enough. And that's why you need that assistance. So just an example is that all wood siding was re was replaced and repainted in 2011 and cost ten thousand um, dollars. And you know you can explain. Um, you know I I maintained my barn. However, there was a storm or uh, you know or, or or what have you, and it still deteriorated. And I still need to you know go back and redo my roof once again or redo my foundation or that I spent all my money doing my roof ten years ago. Now I need to focus on the foundation. You know just give us that context of of how you uh, how you maintained your barn and, and how you still need a little assistance in a specific area. All right, probably one of the two biggest parts is the project proposal and budget. And like I mentioned, you're going to want to fill it out in chronological order. Um, so here, you're not seeing very much information to fill out, but if you click on re-roofing and let's say structural or uh, let's say exterior restoration, it pops out for you to fill out. And if you want to prepare this ahead of time on your own separate document, that's certainly advised and it helps you copy and paste fairly quickly when you're ready to, to fill it out. Or if you want to fill it out within this form, like I said, there is a save and continue later feature. But for each kind of, each one of the four work types, re-roofing, structural stabilization, exterior, interior, you're going to want to describe verbally what it is. You're going to want to give us a proposed timeline of how long it takes. And you're going to want to give us the total cost of that specific work type. Now, um, there's plenty of projects that are just re-roofing or are just replacing six windows or just foundation repair. So don't feel like you have to complete one or more of these, but if you do, help us help you by keeping that clearly separated into those work categories so that we know uh, next June, they're gonna do their roof repair. And then next August, they're gonna get to the foundation. So that's when you want to be clear in your timeline and in your separated budgets um, and who is doing the work, what materials, all that information that you prepare ahead of time shows us that you're ready to go on with the project and that the only thing that is making you hesitant is that uh, your funding need, right? It's like you, you, you would like to be rewarded or incentivized for your reinvestment back into your barn, um, but you're ready for everything else. You know how to get a contractor, you know your timeline, you know your budget. Um, so there is some homework for you to do as a grantee or as a barn owner that helps us show to the committee that you're one of the top candidates for this grant program, you're ready to go, right? Uh, one way to really lose points in this section is if you just mark re-roofing and you don't have a bidder and you don't have materials and you're saying, hey, I know my roof is collapsing. Um, I think a roof costs $80,000, I don't know what materials I'm using, and I think I'm going to do it in the summer, you know, that's not a very robust application to show the committee that you're ready to go, right? So that's the upfront homework that you really want to do is get a clear scope of work, get a clear work plan with um, your budget, your timeline, who's going to do it, what are they going to, what materials they're going to do it with, and at any point you have a question during that and you don't want to commit to anything, like I said, feel free to reach out. Hey, I got a roofer, but he said he can only do this type of roof, not the current historic roof I have. Is that going to be okay? Um, you know, reach out to us and we can help you navigate during that phase uh, rather than you submitting blindly and then finding out later that you were scored lowly because it didn't fit quite right into the program. So that's just something to keep in mind. So when you fill out these sections, 
it calculates automatically for you the total cost, and it also calculates automatically for you the grant award. So like I said, keep in mind that the grant award is a reimbursement process. So whatever project you choose, be ready and show that you're ready to pay for it up front. And as an incentive or as a participant of the program or you know, us trying to support you as someone who also values uh, agricultural history within the state, uh, it's gonna be a reimbursement after the fact, right? So, and that's gonna be calculated as 50% of the total project cost uh, because of that one-to-one -one match we talked about earlier. So now that you know how to, how to approach your project, how to find out what parts of your barn needs the most attention, how to show that you're ready to move forward with the project. The, one of the last few things is that cash match versus in-kind match worksheet. Um, and it's basically showing us that you have the means to begin the project. So there's different ways to think about this and I'm gonna to try to break it down here and it's going to be reiterated on both the uh, guidelines and procedures packet as well as this online application. So don't hesitate uh, to reach out if you have any other questions, but a cash match, that's the most simplest way to show that you are contributing your 50% or your one-to-one -one match to the project. Um, that means that you put in uh, $50,000 and we're giving you back $25,000, but still at the end of the day, at the end of the project, you committed your own $25,000. That's the cleanest uh, match. But there are other ways to reach that because you know we understand that projects are complicated and sometimes uh, the financial uh, development of that project can be complicated. And there's people and organizations and family members uh, and friends that want to help you out in their own way. And that's very possible with the, uh, the Heritage Barn grant program. And we call that a uh, in-kind match. So what that means is donated labor, materials and equipment. Um, and whenever someone provides donated labor materials and equipment, there's specific rates that you have to use, like for example, um, all volunteer labor, like if, uh, if you have family members or friends or a community group that is going to uh, clean all of the debris within your barn, uh, you don't have to pay them or you don't have to bill them necessarily, but what we value that donated labor as is $25 an hour, right? So you wanna show uh, all the hours added up to meet uh, up to 50% of your total project cost. And it's a little confusing, but I, I do have some uh, examples to show you. And let me go to it right now. Okay, so here are the different kinds of funding examples. And this, both, this goes both to the timeline of your project as well as your budget. So like I said, the, the cleanest, simplest, most traditional way to uh, participate in this grant program is all cash, no in-kind match. And that's, let's say a $20,000 foundation repair. You hire a contractor and pay $20,000 out of pocket for an all-inclusive all foundation repair. You are reimbursed $10,000 as a grant reward after documenting completion. Pretty simple and clear, right? It's a $10,000 grant. Maximum in-kind match, what that looks like. Let's say that your scope of work is a $20,000 re-roofing job. You buy the shingles yourself from a, you know, a materials provider for $10,000, but you have a roofer friend who says, hey, I've been meaning to help you fix your roof you know, for years, but I know you didn't have the materials. I'll, I'll do the labor for you. You just have to get the shingles, right? So what they did was donate their valued labor at $10,000. So they can either um, charge at the, uh, the compared rate. So what you would do is get uh, contracts or bids on how much that labor would have cost or at bare minimum, it's $25, $25 uh, an hour. Um, but if they're a skilled labor and they show that typically they would charge $60 an hour for a re-roofing job, um, you know, they, they, could, uh, they could bill it that way, right? 
And at the end of the day for that one, you're still reimbursed $10,000 because that's still 50% of the project. But that $10,000 technically goes towards the roof shingle because it is a cash expenditure where we can't, don't, we can't reimburse you for the assumed cost of your friends of your roof or friends donated labor, right? So that's another way. Uh, if you're working in multi-phases and uh, this question comes up a lot about, can we get partial reimbursement or progress payments throughout the program? And the answer is yes, but you want to show that timeline and that need pretty clearly in your, uh, in your application. So make sure you just outline, uh, outline what you're expecting. And keep in mind that there is a request amount and then there is still a way to describe it or verbalize it within your actual submission documentation. So for here, for instance, multi-phase, you, uh, you developed a project that includes a $40,000 foundation repair and roof repair. You perform the foundation repairs yourself because let's say uh, you know, you're a, a contractor and you know how to do it and you do the foundation repair yourself valued at $20,000. However, you, uh, you buy shingles and you hire a roofer for $20,000. At the end of the day, you're still reimbursed $20,000 because you paid a cash expenditure to that $20,000 roof job and you contributed yourself uh, a foundation repair job at the same rate. And those are the two phases of, of, um, of your project, right? It doesn't have to be done all at once. And it can be, there are ways to do a progress payment. We just need you to articulate that that's what you're expecting to do on your timeline and on your budget. And then another way to think about partial reimbursement, and this breaks it down a little bit more. Same thing, $40,000 foundation and roof repair. You buy the shingles and hire a roofer for $20,000. And you did your roof, but you don't have the money to begin phase two of the foundation. So you request a partial payment. So you receive $10,000 reimbursement after documenting completion of phase one, the roofing. Then you're now with that extra bit of money back into your pool, you hire a contractor and pay $20,000 for that foundation repair. And then when you show that you've completed that foundation repair, you're reimbursed another $10,000. So in the same way, you paid $20,000 cash, no in-kind match. And in the same way, you get $20,000 back. Um, so there's different ways to think about it. But at the end, at the end of the day, we can't reimburse any uh, in-kind or donated or assumed expenses. We can only reimburse cash expenditures and therefore, that means that 50% of your project has to be paid with cash. Um, and like I said, this is one of the more, more complicated aspects of the application. If you, if you need in-kind or donated materials, labor, and equipment, um, but we can certainly help you out on a one-on-one a one -on -one basis on, on these kinds of questions. And then let's go back to the application. And as you develop your, um, your match worksheet, and a lot of it is calculated for you, um, you just wanna put it in there and you can also attach part of your documentation, you know, a spreadsheet or how you came to these numbers or the um, cost estimates, all of that extra information or extra homework that you do on your end as the applicant shows us that you know what it takes to complete this project, you know the, you understand the parameters of the project and the required rates to pay uh, people or the, the uh, assumed rates for volunteers or how to get a, uh, a quote for, you know, four hours of a tractor rental or something like that. Um, all that that you do ahead of time shows us that you're ready to begin the project. And then here are just some extra questions to help us develop a fuller picture of your financial need and your, um, you or your contractors qualifications to do the job. Um, you can basically explain, you know, who they are or who you are or, or kind of what kind of experience you have worked on historic buildings and financial need. Basically, um, 
this explains the uh, this is a chance for you to explain why you need that specific grant support and you know what would happen if you weren't able to get the grant this year. And um, like I said, you want to be honest here, but you also don't be shy about you know really telling us why you need this grant project now, like why why your roof or your foundation can't wait another two years or can't wait another four years for the next biennium cycle. Um, but your honesty and your accuracy is going to be supported by the photos and the uh, the the contractors' bids that you get. So just keep that in mind. You're trying to build a, a holistic picture of your barn, your project, and your need. And section eight is just one of those uh, logistic questions like, do you agree to the five or 10 year easement? Um, that just means filing an easement with your county saying that, you know, all work will be, uh, all exterior work will be reviewed by uh, the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation and, you know, you won't do anything that's basically against the historic preservation ethic. Like if, if, if we award you, um, you know, $20,000 to re-roof re your barn, but in two years, you're gonna demolish your barn so that you can sell the property. That's breaking that historic easement and that maintenance agreement. And at that time, you know, there are enforcement measures to, for you to return that grant award. But you know, we don't even need to go down that rabbit hole. This is just a simple yes or no. I agree to the, the standard parameters that I'll maintain my, my barn for five to 10 years, depending on how much uh, uh, dollar allocated uh, threshold you reach. Public access, just basically, uh, and visibility from right of way is explaining, can you see it from the street? And if you can't see it from the street, you know, are you willing to have uh, people uh, tour your barn or do any kind of educational promotional event. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean that you put it on yourself. Uh, sometimes it could just mean allowing me or someone from DAP to send, to make an educational video. Like uh, a few years ago, like uh, Chris's background image for barn week, uh, you know, they did a tour of, of, of actual real life barns that sometimes might not be so publicly accessible. So like I said, it, it that part of the, program requirement isn't to make random strangers come to your property. That's not the kind of, of barn or farm that you run. It just means that it is, a, it is a public program for a public good, and there has to be some aspect of public access. And then finally, attachments. So I really think that you should uh, print this section out, or at least have it in the back of your mind. Um, and let me go back to the slide. These are the extra files that you're not going to find within the application that you need to attach to the application with digital files. And that's going to include any contract bids, cost estimates, condition assessments that you use or you found to develop your proposal or your scope of work or your project. Basically, what homework you did on your end to show that you're not just making up random numbers, right? And sometimes, if you know, if you're a professional contractor yourself, you know, it's okay to use numbers that you know, but just show us that in some type of way. Uh, images or product pages of proposed materials for project work. So that's just a simple way of saying if if any part of your project requires replacement of materials or introduction of new materials that we know what those materials are. So like if you're replacing your asphalt shingle roof, we just wanna make sure that the new roofing material is compatible. Uh, if you're replacing your siding, we wanna know if it's gonna be wood or if it's gonna be this exact type of, uh, of cut or design. Um, you know, you could get that from a screenshot of the product page or a Home Depot brochure or anything like that. Building images. So regardless of the condition assessment, section of the parts that you want to focus in on, you want at least four high resolution digital images of each side of the building. And, you know, uh, camera phone technology is great nowadays. Uh, you can use that. Or if you have a DSLR camera or a digital camera, you know, we definitely want clear images. And uh, there is opportunities for me to conduct to, uh, to conduct site visits. And if you need to schedule that, like let us know in advance. But uh, you should be able to get photos of each side of your of the building on your own as well. 
detail images. So these are the extra images that really highlight the need of your project. Show us where the wall is falling down. Show us where there is a hole in your siding. Show us where the cupola has completely collapsed. Get up close to those so that you can show us that it's truly in disrepair and needs attention and urgency. One context image, and this is just the, um, the right of way part, um, you know, show us, you know, take a step back away from your property, show us how, how it looks from the road or across the river or wherever you're at, just to see where we are on the land or on the property. If you're a local non-government, we just need you to, uh, to provide a mission statement and lead staff an annual budget. So because, you know, it's government, we need, to, we need that kind of documentation. For nonprofits, we need a list of board members and their affiliations to make sure that there's not um, you know, conflict of interest or anything like that. And then once you have all those extra files, extra photos, extra documents, extra um, bids, contracts, screenshots, you're going to want to list that for me into, uh, into a document and basically just say, uh, attachment one, barn name, descriptive title like the trust barn, front facade photo, trust barn, rear facade photo, um, uh, re-roofing bid one, re-roofing bid two. And that helps us sort it on our end to be able to provide a clean, clear uh, application for the committee to review. And then um, we're almost done here and we can open up for questions. Just as the, as the very last thing, the certification submission is just uh, an acknowledgement that, you know, all the information is above and accurate and that, you know, you're authorized to submit this if you're not the actual owner. Um, and then uh, one more time, your email, just so that we know exactly who to send this to. It's also the email that is used that automatically generates a copy of your entire application so that you have it for your own reference. Like, what did I ask money for? Two months ago, um, you know, we'll we'll have that in there for you. And like I said, a save and continue later button. Um, but yeah, we moved through that pretty quickly, and and we're approaching the one hour mark. So I'll um, I'll go back to this front screen and uh, and open up for questions. Uh, I know Chris has been tackling a bunch, and and Chris, if you want to um, say any out loud for any of our viewers, uh, we can we can. Uh, revisit any of those points as well but uh thank you thank you for um for having me i'm gonna take a, a water but i'll uh i'll wait for chris to chime back in yeah thanks so much we it was great to to get that overview and we certainly understand that that is a lot to get through um in the course of an hour uh i did include a bunch of things in the chat so uh scroll through that i i would especially encourage folks to take the uh, links out of there, um, copy and paste those. Uh, so you have them links to our um, web page where the application is as well as links to the DAP website, which has more information and, and uh, again, other links with uh, additional information about the program. Um, other questions as they come up, I know it's a webinar style, so people can't actually come on and, and speak, but do put questions in the chat. One other one um, that came up is, is there a registry of recommended contractors who can do repair work, regardless of whether we win a grant, um, or guides on restoring if we want to do the restoration if we don't win the grant? Um, so it's certainly to that second part, I included in the chat, and I'll throw it back in there again, um, uh, the guidelines about rehabilitation and, and did a great job of explaining it. It's, it's essentially where you have existing historic material, you wanna repair it if at all possible. If it's deteriorated to the point beyond repair, then you replace it in kind. And by in kind, we mean with the same materials, um, the same profile, the same kind of that sort of, that sort of thing. A registry of recommended contractors, we can't, we can't technically recommend the contractors to folks we really provide references but but we can um uh, and, and when i say that i mean we can't we can't give preference to a, a contractor we can work on um uh, providing lists of folks who have worked on barns in the past 
Uh, and some of those are going to, of course, be regional. Someone who's done work on a barn in a, the Olympic Peninsula probably isn't going to be doing work down in the Palouse, uh, although maybe they will. So I would contact us um, specifically one-on-one, -on -one, reach out to we, and, and we can provide uh, some of those contacts for folks who have done work on barns. Um, but, but certainly it, it would be great if we know Typically, what has been the case is we have had far more in requests for grant funds than we've had available to distribute in grant awards. So to the degree that people would like to, uh, you know, do the work on their own, regardless of whether they get a grant, you know, that's great. That, that's, that's exciting for us. Um, that said, we do have more in funding than we've ever had in the past. The legislature uh, did provide a million dollars for the 2021-23 biennium. And so there's some admin costs that are associated with that. But, um, but we do anticipate, uh, you know, roughly a million dollars being available. So, uh, so we can certainly work on that. I will again um, put into the chat uh, the links to those guidelines about how barns should be rehabbed, and hopefully you guys can grab those. Um, and then another question that came up is, can funds go to other structures on site? My chicken coop needs help. Um, the answer is yes. So you can request funding for other agricultural buildings on your barn. Uh, on your farm complex or on your farm cluster, we like to call them. So sure, there can be a barn, there might be a silo, there might be a chicken coop, there might be a granary, there might be a hop kiln, there might be a root cellar. So um, you can request funding for any one of those buildings. What you need to do is is talk about them, of course, in the con in the the grant application itself, and and define it in in that um, application. I will say that that we have seen. Typically, um, because of the need out there, uh, the, the committee does like to fund work to barns, generally being the primary building on the structure. But we've had several awards where um, ancillary structures have received funding as well. We've, we've had a couple of awards where, you know, barn, the barn has received funding as well as a chicken coop, as well as a granary. So um, we, we certainly have seen multiple buildings um, come through that way. If there are and, other uh, questions, throw them in yeah. the chat. I'm going to add a couple other links in there. Go ahead. And, and, we... and that that was a, a trick question from uh, from Michael Hauser, our state architectural historian. So, uh, you know, like I said, reach out to him if if he if if you need to check in on the historic status of your barn because I think he was trying to get us to say that. Uh, well, make sure the chicken coop is is on the state register, right? Um, so make sure you, you get that aspect of, the, of the, your application as well. Um, maybe it's, it's the biggest chicken coop in the state or the first, and it's still significant and, and all of its pieces are there, but make sure that it's on the, on the state register at, at bare minimum before you proceed. Okay, one other thing to note as well, um, if your barn is not yet listed in the Heritage Barn Register, um, there is still time to do so. Of course, there is a requirement that it must be listed in order to apply for grant funds, in order to get grant funds, um, but there is still an opportunity to do that. And that goes through Michael Hauser. So uh, they're, they're uh, on their website, they have the application to the nomination form to get your barn listed. I would not wait or hesitate to, to get that started if your barn is not yet listed. It, it's not a super cumbersome process. Um, it's providing some history about the barn, some facts about the barn, and some photos about the barn submitted to Michael. Um, but if you do not yet have it listed, I would certainly uh, uh, move forward with doing that um, as soon as possible. I am going to look, I believe, the um, Michael probably has it as, at his fingertips if he's still on. Uh, but the next, um, uh, the next, deadline to submit um, for the to submit a nomination to the Washington Heritage Barn Register is I'm looking for it as I'm going through this if you can September 24th <laughs> thank you September 24th we got it okay Michael saved me next round is due September 24th 
Um, another question that came in from Nancy, can the grant include improving drainage issues with the barn, like installing a ditch to redirect water away from the barn? Yes, that is considered capital. We have done some drainage projects in the past. I think you would put that under that, that structural stabilization component. If we're talking about work around the foundation, um, around the structure, typically if we're trying to get water away from the barn, it is to help with structural or foundation issues. So if you're talking about that, I would put that uh, um, in that section, but certainly um, irrigation work, installing French drains, that sort of thing, those are eligible capital projects. A good question about those other buildings on um, uh, the farm complex, it's do they need to be registered as well? And that's a great question. And the answer to that is yes. On the Heritage Barn nomination form, that form which you submit to get your barn registered. Um, there's information about the barn, uh, information requested about the main barn. There's also um, space on that form uh, to include information about those ancillary buildings. So the, the second page of that form actually says, you know, is there a chicken coop? Is there a silo? And asks for some real basic information about them. Um, so yes, you, you would need to have those ancillary buildings listed as well and that becomes part of that heritage barn nomination form that gets submitted to michael hauser at dap well all righty uh if that is uh all the questions um we will sign out i'll i'll leave on the screen for a little bit longer but uh we appreciate you all coming and uh if, if you need to re-listen to it it will be posted on our website and social media um so take a look at that but uh, you guys have my contact and i i look forward to, to any questions we receive remember october 17th by midnight <laughs>